Uh, hi everyone, got a short lecture here on uh, person-centered therapy. Uh, person-centered therapy um, derived from uh, sort of a, a humanistic uh, psychology movement, which uh, which sort of broadly argued that people have free will, um, but they're and, and so they they can make uh, the t the decision to change and follow through on that change. That their uh, their their sort of fate isn't determined by you know uh, their upbringing or or a set of factors or something like that. But also uh, humanistic also, psychology also argued that people are uh, sort of good by nature. Um, and then uh, that that the sub subjective experience of a person is, is sort of important. And what really meant by that is is uh, their emotions. People need to have sort of a, a, a good emotional life and then they'll have a good uh, life in, in, other, uh, in other domains. Um, humanistic psychology, though, wasn't um, nearly as sort of empirical or quantitative as uh, behaviorism uh, was. It was it was much more uh, sort of qualitative and much more phenomenological, which is a which is a word we'll encounter a couple of times throughout uh, this lecture today. Um, humanistic psychology, and, and really of which person-centered therapy was a part, was sort of a third wave or third force of theories. Um, which means that it, it followed uh, psychoanalysis and behaviorism as sort of the first two forces or first two uh, waves of uh, of, uh, of of um, treatment modalities. So so person centered therapy and, and, and humanistic psychology sort of were a, a third wave, uh, third or you know that that sort of third force. So the the key name in uh, in person centered uh, therapy was Carl Rogers. He he died in 1987, but uh, lived a fairly long and, and productive life. Um, I believe he was born in Chicago, but was raised on a farm in uh, in the Midwest. And he came from a family that was um, uh, that was uh, sort of they held fundamentalist, uh, fundamentally religious viewpoints. Um, they were uh, they were judgmental and skeptical of other people's values and, and ways of thinking about things. <laughs> And uh, by all accounts, uh, Rogers' family was pretty cold. They didn't, they didn't talk about feelings. They didn't really share uh, sort of deep thoughts um, with uh, with each other. Um, Rogers uh, talked about his childhood as he, he felt distant from other people. He was he was bookish. You know, he was pretty intellectual. Uh, he was pretty isolated as well, and that probably was a function of not only the rural area in which he grew up, but also sort of the 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 sort of strict religious views of his, uh, of his family. So in some ways, the, 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 um, the treatment theory that he developed was sort of, uh, warm and affectionate and genuine, uh, and, and had a, and that had elements of closeness to it. And that was sort of uh, him pushing against or pushing back against his, uh, uh, his sort of, uh, uh cold, um, and, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, sort of cold and impersonal uh, religious, um, you know, upbringing, um, but in a in a religious family. So, he um, he trained as a psychologist in Columbia. I believe he graduated in 1931. Uh, he he actually worked at the University of Rochester from I believe 1935 to 1940. Um, he went. Uh, let me just move myself so you can see what uh, what the rest of the the, the uh, slide here says. He went, uh, he went to Ohio State after that and then to La Jolla, California, where he started the Center for Studies of, of the Person. Uh, La Jolla is in the southern part of California near, uh, near San Diego. So he, he worked in a variety of, uh, of, of places and sort of throughout the, the um, rather uh, lengthy uh, career that he had, um, his, his views of, um, of, uh, of what person-centered therapy was sort of took on four um, uh, sort of four distinct time points. Um, and so I've, I've just summarized them here. Um, and so in the forties, he developed this idea of, of non-directive counseling. Uh, and really the role of the clinician was simply to help people express, uh, clarify and gain insight into their, uh, emotions. Uh, in the 1950s, um, uh, well, and, and let me say one more thing in the 1940s, he was working uh, an awful lot on sort of treatment with children. That's what his work at the University of Rochester was on. Um, and so he really, um, uh, part of part of what he was thinking about was this non-directive 
uh, counseling treatment with, uh, with children. So then in the 1950s, he developed this idea of uh, client-centered therapy, which actually sort of modified his views on non-directive counseling. Um, so what he did is he, he sort of, he modified non-directive counseling um, to, uh, so that the, the therapist took a more active and deliberate role, and, and the therapist's role became one uh, where he or she needed to express empathy, empathy and congruence and acceptance. Um, he argued uh, that really it was the therapeutic environment, I'm sorry, that the therapist creates the environment for, for uh, people to change. Um, he also, uh, during this time, articulated sort of 19 principles, and although he modified them and they never really became sort of a centerpiece of his theory, um, they're, the 19 principles of, of therapy are something that, that people um, still, still talk about. Uh, in the 1960s, he wrote a book called On Becoming a Person, uh, and in this um, book, he really articulated his idea of what it meant to be a healthy person. There's a typo on the slide there. I should say healthy person. Um, and his, his argument was that a healthy person was one who's sort of open to experience. A healthy person appreciates and trusts themselves. Um, they, are, uh, they are guided by sort of an inner locus of, of control. Um, not really an external locus, but an internal locus, locus of control. And this is a, 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 a state that really takes a, a lifelong um, or a lifetime to develop. And so a person has to be sort of committed to a lifetime of growth. Um, in the 1970s, this was now towards the end of his, um, of his, of his sort of academic career, Rogers replaced the term client-centered with person-centered, and his view really expanded to sort of all of humanity. His methods were applied um, sort of notably to like family studies and education, uh, business, politics, so on and so forth. And um, this is when he, um, so I'll just move myself so you can see what, uh, what that slide says here. This is, this is sort of when his ideas um, uh, really were identified as, as being less about a system of, of counseling and a system of therapy more into a, and, and expanded more into a way for helping professionals to uh, be and act in the world. And that's sort of what we're going to talk about here in the next couple of, uh, couple of minutes. Let me just advance um, this slide. So a couple of big ideas about, um, about, uh, um, person-centered therapy. Um, so Rogers would have believed that people are sort of essentially strong. Uh, um, they're, we're, we're basically strong people. We're basically able to handle our own difficulties. Uh, our environment just might not be conducive to our strengths and our ability to handle these problems. And so what the, the, the job of therapy really is, is, is for people to uh, create the right environment um, so that they will grow and develop into their full potential. One of the metaphors he, he would have used to sort of communicate this point was the acorn metaphor. So an, so an acorn, uh, if it doesn't have the right environment, won't do anything. It'll just sort of stay this little nut in a shell. Uh, but an acorn, if it's you know, planted in the right amount of dirt and has you know, soil and nutrients and sunshine and all the things it needs, will grow into sort of a mighty oak tree. And so Rogers would have argued that the, the, the environment is really uh, crucial in order for people to grow and realize their potential. Um, and, and one of the environments that people would have functioned in is, is, the, is, is that, that therapeutic environment, that therapy room. And it, so it was the goal of the clinician to create sort of a healthy uh, environment in the therapy room in order for clients to grow. Um, so uh, the, the broad goal of treatment, we'll talk more specifically about this in a second, but the broad goal of treatment is to sort of affirm and empower people so that they can make changes that they want to. Rogers also um, sort of coined, or was one of the first to coin this idea of the dignity of, and worth of a person, um, that all people are sort of inherently worthy and worthy uh, and, and, um, and uh and, and valuable. And this was language that was pretty, uh, pretty readily picked up by social workers, and we owe uh, him a debt of gratitude to that. So um, we know from, uh, from reading the, 
uh, code of ethics and things like that, uh, that, uh, that the dignity and worth of a person are sort of key values of our profession. But Rogers also thought that people have a right to their own thoughts and opinions, um, and that regardless of whether or not the therapist agrees or supports a person's thought or, uh, thoughts and opinions, uh, people must be accepted who they are uh, by, by, their, uh, by their therapists. This, uh, as we'll see here in a second, this sort of morphed into the, the idea of meeting people where they're at. Um, so person-centered therapy also uh, had, this, um, uh, had this perspective called uh, the phenomenological viewpoint. Um, and phenomenology was this thing that was developing in sort of academic circles, particularly in humanities and, and social sciences during the time that Rogers would have been working in the 50s and 60s. Um, so phenomenology is sort of broadly this idea that something can only be judged against itself. It can't be sort of compared um, to something external. So um, uh, what one of the places this came from was sort of cultural studies. So we can't compare one culture to another because that's um, that sort of very quickly gets the person who's doing the comparing to a place of uh, of, um, of oppression and and uh, um, uh, and and and, uh, and and restrictive views. You can really only judge a culture against itself. And and so Rogers was sort of uh, the key figure who applied this idea to. Um, sort of the therapeutic world and the, and the helping world. So we, we can really only judge clients against themselves. We can't, uh, we can't expect them to adhere or conform to some sort of external set of, set of benchmarks or something like that. And so what this also means though, is that clients are really the only people who can uh, inform and dictate the terms of their treatment. Um, Phenomenology, believe it or not, lives on in sort of qualitative uh, research, including in social work. Um, it's sort of a, become a value that's a little bit more pervasive in the profession, um, but, but has roots uh, in, in sort of some, of some of Roger's writing and thinking. So uh, a couple of broad goals of, of person-centered therapy. Um, so uh, the broad goals are to help people be present in the moment, to promote self-awareness, uh, to help people feel empowered and optimistic, to work on their self-esteem and, and sense of personal responsibility and, and their autonomy. These are really sort of humanistic values. Um, but what you can see here is that these goals are pretty abstract. Um, and, and it's not sort of, uh, time limited and directive, like say something like, uh, uh, behavioral therapy would have been, um, these are hard goals to measure. You know, how do you assess how present a person is in the moment? Um, and so what, what Roger's work really sort of morph, morphed into was the, the personal qualities of a therapist and how a therapist should act. Um, when she or he is sitting with, uh, with clients. So one of the things that Rogers was talking about was this idea of the therapeutic alliance. And that's the, the therapeutic alliance is really this, the strength of the relationship between the clinician and the client. Uh, Rogers would have believed that a strong therapeutic alliance is essential for effective therapy. Um, that, that's what helps create an environment in which, or a therapeutic environment in which people can grow and change. Um, Rogers would have also thought that the therapeutic alliance allows people to trust themselves and, and, and sort of make use of their, uh, of their potential. In essence, Rogers was also talking about how clinici clinicians should be with clients. And so how do you, you know, how do you sit with someone who's, who's distressed and having an awful lot of doubts? Uh, Rogers thought that clinicians should be trustworthy and genuine, non-judgmental, uh, and they should always treat their 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 clients with um, with unconditional positive regard. Um, in this way, um, Rogers was also making use of uh, of sort of a social learning modality, uh, because he thought clinicians can be models of of, uh, of healthy people for their uh, for their clients. So um, Rogers was was working uh, sort of alongside um, uh, the social learning theorists and the, and the behaviorists. Uh, he was working alongside um, uh, Bandura, um, you know, people who were thinking about uh, the, the learning through watching others, 
uh, kinds of kinds of things. So, um, Rogers uh, posited uh, four or five sort of essential conditions for um, for a, a good therapeutic environment, um, and he called them genuineness, congruence, immediacy, uh, acceptance, and then empathic understanding. Uh, the non-directiveness, which I've also listed under there, which is the, the sort of sixth essential uh, component of a therapeutic condition, is, um, is uh, uh, sorry about that, I just uh, paused the video for a second while we had a, uh, a, a dog barking. Um, so what I was talking about was sort of the uh, essential therapeutic conditions, and this non-directiveness one which was the sixth one, but it was sort of less important than, than the others. Uh, so, so Rogers would have believed that it was important for clinicians to be genuine, um, which means that uh, clinicians know themselves, they, they trust themselves, and they have an awareness of how their, their, uh, their presence impact um, others. Um, it also meant that people were free to bring in sort of honest and, and genuine emotional reactions into, uh, into, a, into a therapy room. Um, um, Rogers also believed that that uh, that clinicians should be congr should have congruence, uh, and that's that our inner selves and our outer selves should be congruent, and so our uh, our 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 emotions should reflect our affect. Um, sometimes we we do this thing called affect regulation, where uh, we change the the outward experience of emotion um, so that it's different. Um, or, or at least dissimilar to what our what our inner affect is, um, if that's what the situation is called for. But Rogers would have believed that people should, by and large, be congruent. That what you feel should be what what you express. Uh, then there was this idea of immediacy, which is simply being sort of present in the moment, uh, not distracted. Um, and and then Rogers would have also believed that uh, that clinicians should should uh, demonstrate acceptance that we should care about. Uh, we should like our clients. We should uh, respect them. Um, this is where he would have nested sort of this this idea of unconditional positive regard, which he termed, uh, or which he defined as is this idea that people are doing the best that they can in the moment, and and clinicians always acknowledge that. And so uh, we we're never we're never sort of rejecting of a client's um, uh, uh, statements or behavior or presence. We're always accepting of them. We're always uh, sort of welcoming of them um, in them. We're never condemning them. Um, and then uh, the last of sort of the the, the five essential uh, therapeutic conditions would have been this idea of empathic understanding. And that's really it, it, what he really thought of this is that uh, clinicians are conveying uh, an, an accurate sort of experience of what, what people are feeling and experiencing in that moment. And then expressing to clients that they're heard um, and so each of these things um, is is sort of hard to do. We're going to get into this in a, in a minute when we start to talk about limitations. But each of these things are sort of hard to do. But, um, you know, Rogers would have believed that you sort of take all of these things together and all of these sort of inform how you uh, how you act in the uh, in the uh, in the therapy room. And then, of course, there was this idea of non-directiveness, which is something he developed very early on in his career. And that was really allowing clients to take uh, charge of the, uh, the therapeutic process. So Roger's uh, theory is, um, is, uh, is applied actually in, in a lot of different ways. And, and, and for the most part, it's uh, applied behaviorally. It's, it's how we sit with clients when they're talking about things that are, um, that are highly emotional, things that are shameful to them. So, um, so a very person-centered thing to do would be to normalize an emotional reaction. So that would be saying something like, I would have been angry too if X or blank had happened uh, to me. Um, uh, clarifying direction, clarifying values is also a very sort of person-centered thing to do. Uh, so you might say that something like this to a client. You mentioned that you wanted to pursue education, or you wanted to pursue uh, repairing your relationship with your father. You mentioned that you wanted to pursue, um, you know, uh, a new hobby or something like that. Tell me why these things are important to you. And then this idea of unconditional positive regard is something that's also really uh, communicated behaviorally. So, so just give a thought, or give some thought as you're as you're watching this video to how you might react if a client made a disclosure. 
especially a disclosure that was attached to uh, a lot of emotion like shame or guilt or something like that. So the, the example that I chose, I, I didn't, you know, I, I'm just choosing this, uh, uh, you know, not for any reason in particular, just because it's uh, something that, that uh, frequently comes up in therapy. So suppose a client says something like, um, I feel awful for cheating on my spouse. A very person-centered uh, reaction or, or response to that statement would be to, to sort of normalize the, the reaction uh, and then convey a positive regard. So I understand you feel guilty for cheating on your spouse. Do you want to talk about what led you to the point of, uh, of cheating? Um, that's fairly non-directive because um, it leaves open the, 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 the opportunity for um, the, the client to say, no, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about my feelings or something like that. Um, it, it, it is a touch, it is a touch directive. And so maybe not truly um, uh, person centered, uh, but what it doesn't do is, is sort of uh, condemn the client or, um, or, or often offer up some kind of, uh, some kind of judgment um, for, uh, for what it is the content of that disclosure was about. And so, uh, like I said, oftentimes unconditional positive regard is often done uh, sort of behaviorally as well. So, um, so Rogers would have thought an awful lot about how a person's, you know, face conveys or, or in their body language, their, their unwritten communication conveys uh, what it is they're trying to convey verbally as well. Uh, and so you can just sort of imagine uh, what kind of facial expressions might convey unconditional positive regard when a client is making a disclosure like, uh, like cheating on a spouse or something like that. Um, so there's some, some, I think, reasonable criticisms of uh, person-centered therapy. It didn't necessarily solve uh, the, the issue of unending therapy like behavioral approaches did. So in that way, it was much more, um, it was much more akin to sort of psychoanalysis. Um, Person-centered therapy is pretty leisurely, it's inefficient, it's, it's unfocused, it's not directive, it's not sort of um, problem-oriented like behavioral uh, 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 forms of, of therapy would be and other, other sort of brief forms of intervention that we'll learn about at some point this semester. Um, it's, also, it's also fairly simplistic um, and, and in the same vein, it's, it's easy to understand but it's sort of hard to do. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's easy to get stuck on the sur surface level. So um, it's pretty easy to sort of think that that one is conveying, um, you know, something like unconditional positive regard. But are you really? Um, are you really listening to clients without uh, without judging them? Are you really valuing the dignity and worth of a person, or are you just saying that you that you are? Um, these things, uh, as I've as I've sort of mentioned down here, these things it's really hard to sort of evaluate them quantitatively. You, you sort of have to do it qualitatively, which gets at that sort of phenomenological viewpoint we've mentioned a few a few times here. Um, this is sort of what's challenging about uh, about person centered therapy. Um, and then, of course, there are people for whom person centered therapy really isn't uh, isn't suited. That's probably people with pretty severe psychopathology, uh, people who really aren't interested in change or see no reason for change. Um, and it, it's also, um, uh, person-centered therapy is fairly Western oriented. Um, so it would be pretty inappropriate for someone uh, from a culture where sort of community and value, or value uh, community and family are valued over the self. That's what, uh, that's what this uh, says here um, in this particular. Uh, that particular uh, that particular bullet uh, bullet point. Um, so so you know Rogers' form of therapy was was pretty American, and he really designed it to 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 work in an American setting. Um, it, it's really focused on the individual and and uh, and and places the individual over family and community, and and uh, in in that way it doesn't necessarily recognize uh, the values of other of other cultures. Nevertheless, despite these criticisms, um, it, Rogers' work has made some some uh, some pretty lasting contributions, and, and most notably, it's really uh, it really gave clinicians some guidelines for how to act, uh, for how to it really gave guidelines for for clinicians to sort of uh, 
how they should be with clients, how they should sit with clients, and how they should act in the uh, in the therapy room. It also allowed clients to be themselves. It it gave people sort of rights to their own thoughts and op- opinions. Um, it emphasized relationships, especially the relationship among um, the client and therapist, and and really brought to the forefront this idea of a therapeutic alliance, which is sort of um, a, a real, I mean, it's widely acknowledged as a key component of, uh, of change. And it emphasized, lastly, the client's uh, uh, frame of reference. And like I said a few minutes ago, this sort of became uh, meeting people where they're at, uh, which is very much a value of, of social work practice. But uh, to, uh, to Rogers, um, where we owe really a debt of gratitude to Rogers for sort of uh, developing that idea. So uh, that'll uh, conclude uh, this lecture. Uh, Thanks for watching. As always, feel free to get in touch if you have any questions.